Well, uh, today, first, I'm George, uh, one of the elders here at the mountain, in case you haven't met me. I think I've actually met everybody out there. So good, excellent. Um, today we're going to be looking at the second of three psalms called Psalms of Ascent. Um, these are songs of pilgrimage, songs of approaching Jerusalem and the temple. Um, the psalm is short, uh, but it's definitely going to pack a punch. It, it offers the hope of rescue, um, the joy of deliverance, um, a cry for God to act, which produces a sustained, joyous shout. Um, as the proverbial pilgrim ascends the staircase to the temple proper, the community lifts up a joyful prayer that God might bring the nation back fully restored. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship. We thank you that your desire has always been to make a people who would declare the greatness of your love. God, we pray that you would take this word and implant it deep in our hearts, that we might respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, you may have heard part of this story, but um, probably not in this context. Um, when I went to college, um, I went as an electrical engineering student, and I went under Air Force scholarship because, to be honest, I didn't think there was any other way I could go to school. Not a very noble reason, maybe, um, but I did it because that was how I was going to pay for school. Um, I really just didn't see any other way. And as I approached the time when I was going to graduate, I started getting more of a little bit of dread. Was this really what I wanted for my life? Was this really what Christ wanted for my life, going into the military and serving in that particular way? But there was nothing to be done about it. Two weeks before graduation, I found out that I was going to be medically disqualified. I happened to pass out sometimes when I stand up, and they didn't like that. <laughs> Yay me. Turns out it was their fault, so I didn't have to pay back my scholarship. Um, I, it, I didn't deserve that. There was nothing about me that was extra special, um, but I saw all throughout it the hand of God. We can talk about providence, but often, you know, as we talk about providence, we also talk about mercy. We talk about God's compassion on us, his, his knowledge. And we're going to see all of these things wrapped up together um, in this sermon. So again, the Lord has been good to me, uh, really far above what I deserve. Um, and in the same way, Israel gets rescued far beyond what they deserved. Um, God displays his love. He displays his faithfulness. He displays mercy and compassion. And so with that, let's jump right into the psalm. So reading Psalm 126, it says, a song of ascents. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So, with the opening of the psalm, we see the hopes and dreams of one generation, many generations realized, the end of, of captivity, uh, the end of bondage. Um, and as Christians, we can easily join in this praise ourselves. We, too, have been rescued. We've been brought together as a people to demonstrate the glory of God to a watching world. And it all starts with a deep, overwhelming sense of gratitude. Uh, the psalm begins, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Um, with this psalm, there's a lot of discussion of what this restored fortunes are. Um, I'm fairly convinced that the setting is the after the Babylonian captivity and their return, um, but it could reflect any other major restoration, but one that specifically is noticed by the nations and, and, and brings their, their knowledge and thanks to God. 
Uh, more importantly, wh what we really need is to see not the specific restoration, which particular event it was, but rather who the restorer is. God's the one who's restored the fortunes of Zion. God is the one who's faithful to his covenant, even though his people have been repeatedly unfaithful to it. There's no boasting in their worthiness or their skill. They were in need, and God acted. The wrap-up of the book of Job uses the same word uh, to describe the way God restored Job after his trials. We spent a while in Job and just seeing the, the suffering, the, the longing for God to show himself to act, um, how that went on and on. And finally, at the last chapter, we see God restoring Job. This is just a hint, maybe, that the exiles, as they came back, would have read Job in maybe a different light than we sometimes read it. We serve a restoring God. But restoring, it's going to imply a loss, some sort of failure, some sort of something to be restored from. And it suggests a purpose. God has a purpose in our exile. He has a purpose in our captivity, in our struggles, in our suffering. Under the hood is a call to trust him until he restores, um, rather than anxiously attempting to extricate ourselves from our own situations. Because that's what we easily do. We easily get caught up in trying to fix things ourselves rather than trust God to fix them in his time. Those who trust him find value in what he values and love what he loves. So what got Israel into this situation in the first place? What, what, what got them into the place where they needed rescue? And for that answer, we can go all the way back to the garden, all the way to the beginning, Genesis 1 through 3. God desired a people, and he started with two, a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. But rather than trust and obey, they took the serpent's lie and were ejected from the garden but God was not done with humanity. He wasn't done with us. Uh, he doesn't give up on his eternal purposes. And his purposes were more than just, I'm going to create something cool. He was actually trying to build, to create a people who could reflect back creation's worship to him. He covenants with Abraham. He prepares himself a people so that he can demonstrate his character, his power, his ways, his plan. And honestly, he picks a people who none of us would have picked. If holiness and faithfulness is what you're after, Israel is not your dream team. Uh, from the very start, they fall into idolatry. They don't even get away from the mountain before they're sacrificing to a golden calf. They're prone to wandering. They enter the promised land and immediately start bowing down to the gods of the land in violation of this covenant that they've been given with God. They reject God's kingship so that they can be like the, the cool kids, the other nations that are around them that they want to be like. Things proceed just as God warned they would. He told them he would receive the glory one way or the other, whether in their blessing or in their cursing. And so the nation went into exile, first the northern half um, under the Assyrians, and then the southern half under the Babylonians. With, with so much history, you could be justified in wondering how any rescue could be possible. Uh, it's really like the audacity of God's mercy leads the psalmist to reminisce. And, and we read again, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Seeing God's deliverance, they're stunned, they're amazed, they're astonished, they're astounded, they're awestruck. That's just the A's, and I'm not going to go any further than that. The psalmist pictures them as, as dreamers, not able to fully comprehend their new reality yet. Their dread and anxiety turns to peals of laughter. Brother turns to brother wordless, but the eyes say the same thing. Can, can you believe what God has done? And then the laughter turns to exuberant shouts of joy. Ringing cries of worship is what the word is meaning. It's that thing where it just echoes off of everything. Thanks to the God of heaven, who's just as faithful as he always said he would be. God has been clear about what was coming. Uh, he told them exactly why he was sending them into exile. Um, and he not only told them that he would bring them back from exile, 
but he told them how long their captivity was going to be. Jeremiah had passed on these words from the Lord. He says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes. That's the same word the psalmist uses. And gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is Jeremiah 29, 1 through 14, if you want to look that up later. I know the plans I have for you is not a promise of material blessing or prosperity. I'll just knock that out. Um, this future and a hope is tied to God's purposes in creating a people who would be his own. Peculiar, some more than others, holy. Uh, the, the point is that they, they knew. They knew what was coming. God had revealed both his character and his plans to them. Still, knowing is different from experiencing. Um, we can read and repeat the truths of God's goodness. That's, that's something altogether together different from the wonder, the overwhelming sense of release at the moment of God's rescue, a rescue you could hardly let yourself believe in if you were Israel. God did not clue them in so that they would gloat the Babylonians of the time of their release. He didn't do that. He did it so that they would revel at his faithfulness when he proved his words true, when he proved his love to Israel in its sin and its ruin, when he proved his sovereign command over even hated Babylon. Jeremiah's words, combined with God's faithful actions, lead straight to Israel's shouts of joy in this psalm. Isaiah goes even further, and I encourage you to take a moment to read Isaiah 60 later today or this week. Uh, but for now, we just need to remind ourselves what those returning Israelites must have felt. Relief, joy, thankfulness, gratitude. But God is not content simply to rescue and receive the praise of his people. Rescue is just his opening act. The restoration of Israel has a, a rippling, reverberating effect. The psalmist now reminds Israel that the world was and is watching. God will receive glory not just from a restored Israel, but from the nations who see his covenant faithfulness and his redeeming love. Verse 2 of the psalm continues. They said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. All along, Israel's mission had been more than just possessing the promised land. Just as Jesus calls us to be light in the world, Israel was meant to present the glory of God so that a wider world might worship. Every time you hear this word Zion, you should really be thinking God's people and God's purposes and God's plan. Not just the capital of a nation, but God's purposes and plan. It's not Israel's holiness that draws the attention of the nations, but it's God's actions. What kind of a God would restore such a wayward nation? What God would desire such a people? He makes them holy. He shows his unimaginable mercy in tangible ways that not even the world can miss. Uh, the wonder of the nations prompts a renewed sense of wonder in Israel. God really has done great things for us. And, and we're called to remember the things God has done for us. And so in brief, um, I just want to remind us of some of what we see in the work of Jesus. Earlier we sang, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Um, you sang it? Here, here's what we were proclaiming. Um, Jesus came as the son of David, rightful king, fulfilling God's covenant with David. Jesus left the praises of heaven to become in every way a human being. Jesus chose to come not as royalty, but as one unregarded, a, a common person. Jesus lived a sinless life, though faced with our temptations. Christ fulfilled a law of holiness we were powerless to keep. 
Christ willingly went to the cross as a sacrifice in our place. Christ's redemption has created a new people and demonstrated the glory and loving character of the Father. Christ has conquered the grave, guaranteeing us the same in the future. And Christ is alive forevermore and promises the same to us. There's even more we can say, sing, shout about what Jesus has done. Um, this is just the content of one song. With John, we can say, if all the works were written down, there's no book that could contain them all. The Lord's done great things for us. So are you glad? With the psalmist, can you say, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. The road ahead is not all roses, though. The psalmist now encourages his readers to respond in faith to God's past acts of mercy. Much like the Christian life, uh, the return from exile was full of difficulties. Uh, present salvation contained components of patient waiting for God to complete what he had started. In light of God's past glorious rescues, the psalmist calls on Israel to put their hands to the plow, to the task ahead of them. He assures them and us that God, full of mercy and compassion, will once again be faithful. He'll prove faithful. And that brings us to the second half of the psalm, which begins in verse 4 with a request to God. It says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Isaiah 10.22 puts it this way, Though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant will return. Release from Babylonian captivity started with just a small fraction of the people, just a remnant. Many had grown comfortable with life in their new home. Their livelihoods will be threatened. Why return when news from home suggested that the land was in disarray? Why return to a home you've never lived in, but just heard stories of? There's no king. The temple is a letdown compared to the pre pr prior glorious structure. An additional migration would occur under the reign of Darius, and then a final one would allow any to return under Xerxes. Many simply never went back. They just didn't. Life was different now. Why go back? We're a different people. The psalmist's plea, though, is that God would complete the job. The work of restoration already begun would be completed, that all Israel might return to the promised land to once again take up their inheritance to God's people, displaying his glory. He likens this return to a downpour in the wilderness. Not just a rain, but a downpour. So the Negev here mentioned is, it's that most southerly portion of Israel. In fact, some translations just say like streams in the south, because that's what it is. It's a southern desert. Um, it's got really very, very little rainfall, uh, but sometimes a winter rain will, will come. It doesn't take much, as little as one inch will do it. Um, the water, the rain, will carve out deep channels in the desert. And all around those channels, like daisies popping up, green, life. The picture is a torrent. It's of a torrent of blessing. It's not just a call for the blessing of annual rains to nourish the crops. This is not just a... A, a prayer as part of the, 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 the religious cultus, the, 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 the normal you know, yearly act of praying for rains to help the crops. That's not what is envisioned here. This is a call for God to act decisively to restore Israel, to take what he's already done in bringing a people back and complete it entirely. It's a call for God to act and for the people to remember how he's acted in the past. And it's, it's God's faithful answer that makes certain what comes in our next verses, verses 5 and 6. He says, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So the picture is of a farmer. You know, he puts, he's put, putting his last seed in the ground. If the crop fails, life is over. There's no grocery store. There, there's no place to go for cheap seed like we might go to Lowe's. There's no way for a second chance. 
He sows in tears because he knows he is dependent on God. In the same way, those who sing the words of this psalm call for the people to endure the hardship to return as God's people, to come back, to be with God's people. There's no other way but to trust and obey. Taken together with verse 4, the picture is, is totally dependence on God, knowing that he's going to be faithful to do whatever it takes to make the people once again whole and holy, restored, proclaiming the excellencies of our God before the world. This imagery is fruitful, to use the same metaphor, in the New Testament. And I want to remind you of four specific examples, two from Paul, one in James, and one from Jesus. First, Paul echoes this psalm in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. I'm not going to read it, but just kind of summarize. It's a, it, it encourages the people um, to give cheerfully to help other believers. Um, he encourages rich sowing in the hopes of rich reaping. Paul has a vision of fruitful giving for the sake of other believers, not to prop up a ministry, but to create a people. He wants a richly connected body, but also a wealth of thanksgiving, of thanksgiving given back to God. So he sees it that when all these people support each other's needs, people are going to see, and they're going to thank God for it. That's exactly what Paul has in mind. And so, just as we think about that, is that how we see our giving? Are we supporting one another? Are we supporting the work of the ministry that will increase God's kingdom and make it known before the world? Are we doing that with joy? Yeah, it can be hard. I mean, sowing with tears, that's the idea. But do we do it envisioning a future hope? So he uses the sowing and reaping imagery again in Galatians 6, 7 through 10. And I am going to read this one. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the fr flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows in the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So Paul calls us to a special relationship with the body of Christ. Uh, we're to do good to everyone, but especially other believers. In the psalm, just as in these passages from Paul, we see that the reward, our future hope, is related to God's people. The call for streams in the Negev, streams in the south, God's overwhelming flood of mercy is about the flourishing of God's people, not just us individually, and this to God's glory. So moving to James, James 5, 7 through 11, um, also pictures a patient farmer. James reminds us that the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord is at hand. That's a truth that we cling to. We recognize God is coming back to vindicate us in our faith. He reminds um, us of the steadfastness of Job, which we saw earlier, is tied to this psalm with the restoration of Job's fortunes. James points us in the midst of patient waiting on God to the fact that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Those are, those are James' words, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He sees the suffering. He sees what we're going through. And he'll respond in kind. He will respond to us faithfully. And finally, Jesus. Jesus repeatedly calls his followers to, he uses the phrase, count the cost of discipleship. Just like the farmer who sows weeping um, while trusting God to bring a beautiful crop, a bountiful crop, we're called to be disciples, uh, to sow the gospel, to pray for the Lord to send workers into the field, all so that God's purposes might be realized, to create a people for himself, from every nation, tribe, and tongue. From the beginning, the very beginning, God has been about the, the business of creating this people for himself. Our time in, in First Peter hopefully helped um, you see how we are to live as exiles in the world. Um, God has already acted decisively in the person of Jesus. Jesus, the seed of Eve, 
the offspring of Abraham, the son of David, bringing together all these promises of, I will make you a people to my glory. But now we wait for vindication from heaven. Uh, with the psalmist, we long to see God's mercy run wild like streams in the desert. We long to be the people he created us to be, worshiping him in community eternally. That's what we sang this morning. That's what we read this morning. So as you read this psalm in the future and, and meditate on it, thank God for his work in the past. Uh, thank him for the salvation he's worked, and, and let the memory empower your faith as you look to the future. Consider how he can take arid wasteland and make it a river of life. He can take our arid, dry hearts and bring life. I said it already once, God is not content to simply rescue and receive the praise of his people. Rescue is just his opening act. The restoration of a single person has a rippling, reverberating effect. It strengthens the body. It commends the gospel to a watching world. God's purpose was always bigger. A people, a community of those in relationship to him. So the question is, are you a part of this people? Jesus calls himself the gate, the, the door. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who leaves the 99 to go after the one, to bring it back into the sheepfold, back to the people. He's the one who created you. He's the one who sustains you. He's the one who welcomes you to find rest, relief, and joy. He created you for worship with his people. And Christian, is your faith marked by joy? Duty is fine, but is it marked with joy as well? By trust? Or by trying to get it done in yourself and then running back when it fails? Do you long for the gathering of his people? And can you pray with the psalmist, restore our fortunes? In the New Testament terms, we might say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Rescue us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time spent in your word. God, help us to see our place in your people. Help us to rejoice in, in your, your past wonderful rescues. Help us to see the way you have provided for us. Help us see what you have done um, for those that came before us. And help us worship you. God, help us not to grow weary as we see what lies ahead, as we see struggle, as we see opposition. God, keep our prayers faithfully directed to you. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy, your provision of your son to be our savior. And we ask you to keep our hearts soft towards you, to see your, your mercy, your kindness, your abounding love and faithfulness for us. In Jesus' name, amen.